uh, welcome everyone to this event. Today uh, we are going to talk about a uh, deep dive on Cisco iOS, iOS XA, XA software release um, on this event. So before we start, I would like to share with you something about the Cisco community. The Cisco community is an online forum with over half a million members, almost one million, where you can get answered to your technical questions prior to opening cases with attack. Also, you can be in the community to answer questions, contribute with documents, videos or blog, or rate all the content that you find there. In the community, uh, uh, you, can, you can boost your career and you can engage with other experts. All right, so before we start, I would like to share with you just some of the news and upcoming events and activities that we have on the community so they can be useful for you. So first of all, we have this forum event, this Ask Me Anything event following this event that is connected to this community live webinar. Uh, what we do on this forum event is actually like all of the questions that you, that you have on this session, uh, if we don't have enough time or we need to validate information to answer the questions of this session, we actually post them and place them in this forum event. Uh, or the other thing is like maybe a few hours after or some days after this event, you, you thought about some of the things that Suman just uh, mentioned in this event. So you have a question, you can go there and post it and we will be helping you out to solve it. Uh, this uh, forum event is going to be available till Friday, June 19. Also, we'd like to invite you to become an event top contributor. That means like someone who contributes in the community. We do recognize uh, people who engage in this community and that helps them out on their career as well. Uh, also, we would like to invite you to read content that you find out in the Cisco community and how we can do that actually. Uh, let's say that you go to the community, make a question and someone else uh, helps you out to solve your, your problem. In that case, if you find the information that they give to you useful, you can give a helpful vote saying, I thank you, that helped me. Uh, and you can do it very easily. The way you do it is actually clicking on the tiny star, as you can see on your screen, that says helpful. And uh, in that way, you can let that people know that it, it was helpful, actually. And the other option is that if you find an answer that really solved your problem, you can mark this, this, this comment as an accepted solution. Uh, this will help us out not only to identify quality content in the community, but also for other people who join the community and, and they have a similar question, they can say, hey, this one is solved, so that is the process, or that is what I have to follow up to solve my issue as well. So, well, uh, let's get started. Uh, I would like to introduce you to the panel that we have today. I'm going to start with the presenter. Uh, we have today Suman Mali. He's a technical marketing engineer in Cisco, uh, the routing platform uh, technical marketing engineering team. He has over 12 years of experience in the IT industry, and he's passionate uh, about network, uh, networking. Suman has deep experience in the quality assurance engineering, drilling escalation handling. Um, and that experience is actually what has shaped him to the expert that he is today. So Suman, uh, good day, and thank you so much for joining us today. Hi, everyone. Thanks, Hilda. Thanks. Sure, thank you. And we also have a uh, question manager that is like the expert that I'm going to help us out to solve all your questions in the meantime that Sumant is presenting. So first of all, ladies first, we have Corelli. Corelli Sankar is a lead team of the technical marketing engineers. She has over 20 years of experience in the IT area and she's a distinguished speaker in Cisco Live events. Corelli holds a CCA in security. Uh, so welcome Corelli, it's always so nice to have you on these events. Thank you so much, Hilda. Sure. And on the other hand, we have uh, Pradeep. Uh, Pradeep is a technical marketing engineer in the BU routing team as well. He has over 15 years of extensive experience as a network consultor, consultant and architecture. He holds three CCIEs, uh, one in service provider, one in data center, and another one in enterprise infrastructure. So thank you so much for joining us today, Pradeep. It's an honor to have you here. Thank you, Hilda. Thanks for having me here. Good. So uh, for all of you who would like to have a deep look and double check everything that Suman is going to share today, you can find out the presentation on the Cisco community. Uh, it's available. Uh, all the information that I'm sharing with you is available on the chat panel allocated at the right side of your screen. Or if you're on a mobile phone, you just click on the part that says chat on the tiny balls that are on the middle of your device. Uh, and well, finally, um, please, all the questions that you have, help us out to submit them in the Q&A panel. Once again, this is located on the right side of your screen, usually at the bottom, uh, in your mobile phone or device phone. 
a mobile device phone uh, that is available in the tiny spheres that you can see at the middle of your screen. That helps us out to cover the questions faster and easier. So uh, if you have any other questions, like I have issues with my audio, my screen freeze, or things like that, uh, please use the chat panel or if you want to connect with us. So finally, uh, let's get started. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass the microphone and the presenter's ball to Suman. Please go ahead and thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Let me share it from my screen. Hi, everyone. Good morning, good evening, and good afternoon from wherever you are joining this call today. I'm really uh, thankful for joining today to learn something here from 17.21 routing release point of view. This slide here, I just wanted to have an icebreaker slide, and I was looking for one. This is something I found. I hope I will be able to break the ice with respect to 17.2.1 single image. Uh, we call single image for a specific reason. I would like you guys to take, take away the particular concept and the thought process and the capabilities that this 17.2.1 iOS X routing image brings in, um, which we release in April timeframe. With that ice breaking, let me just deep dive into the, the main topic today. So most of you might be aware of in the process of getting yourself well, well versed with the broad spectrum of iOS XE routing platforms, as well as the Viptela OS routing platforms that we offer as part of enterprise routing portfolio. All these devices, variety of them, starting from the smallest factor till the the largest uh, ASR 1000 type of platforms, which can uh, say start from one RU device till 13 RU platform a portfolio. They are capable of today's demanding infrastructure, which are needed for the cloud scale networks. The industry is moving towards higher traffic uh, growth, and the internet is demanding higher capacity platforms sitting at your age, sitting at your access point, sitting at the core of the network, and this enterprise routing platform portfolio that you see on the screen uh, is, is catering most of those use cases. Even today, connecting to the multiple clouds, as you see in the, the, the slide here, GCP, Azure, or AWS, and even there are so many other vendors that we connect efficiently to make sure the optimal user experience, um, the ease of deploying variety of use cases, either it's iOS XE side of traditional routing use cases, or it's the sd side of use cases, all of them are addressed in different beautiful situation, uh, the scenarios of deployments and use cases with this broad for product portfolio that we have. With that, let me get into the session topic today. We are going to focus on iOS XE 17.2.1R routing release and what are the new things that the release gets in. Firstly, we'll touch upon a new platform that's being announced or that's being released with 17.2 code. We will touch upon the single image and the, the automation benefits that this image gives uh, with a quick demo as well for SD-WAN as well as iOS XE use cases. Then we'll touch upon the software features that this release is offering from 17.2 perspective and some of the other key features too. After that, there is a bonus section that I added here, which is going to be how the WFH station, the today's pandemic situations, which are demanding for home office type of situation, work from home scenarios, teleworker and micro bank use cases. So we're going to quickly touch upon how beautifully this enterprise routing platform portfolio and the single image together can help us to achieve zero touch provisioning for such use cases. With that, let's have a quick polling question. We wanted to understand, you, on, the, on your screen you will see a polling, uh, polling question. Please look out for that. And we wanted to really understand how familiar you are with today's SD-WAN solutions that Cisco offers. Where does your network stand today? Is it something that you have already implemented? Is it something that you are considering? or you are kind of thinking of it, but you need more details, or is it something that you're not much interested? There is 30 second window remaining for you. Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see we have almost 20% people who are considering this, 22%, and then we do have 8% uh, who have already implemented. That's great. And 12% are interesting. 
interested to know more about it. Yes, I, I, I assume that the session will help you understand some more benefits, especially the single image that's that going to help uh, in the SD-WAN context also as well. Thank you for answering the poll. Let's get ahead. Thank you. Yes, the new platforms. This is an exciting time whenever we launch a new platform for all of us at Cisco as well, because every new platform that we try to get into the market, we are we are having a thought process behind it. We are having a huge investment in terms of innovation, uh, where you know how this platform, this new generation thing, uh, device can help the deep, the networking industry to do 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 things which which are not done till now, or there are different ways of doing with respect to a platform aspect. So all that thought process, and that's why we get excited to really launch something or get something into the market. And what we have with 17.2.1, our image is a terminal server. You might be using it day in, day out while you are accessing devices. Uh, you might be using it. First thing that everybody who starts doing uh, anything in the network networking is getting onto a console of a device. Either it's a virtual entity or so, uh, the physical device, we first try to get into the console. And these terminal server devices in our network deployments as well as the labs that we run, we use it extensively, right? So it's next generation terminal server, C1100 TG, that we call as a short form. Let's see what it brings. We have two variants of it, ideally three, but just two to talk here from the slide point of view. The next slide will tell you what are the th what is the third variation. As you see here, this is a basic need most of the deployments, most of the lab scenarios where we are accessing the device, terminal server. We need async ports to connect to that console ports uh, or auxiliary console ports that you will have on the network devices. This terminal server, the, the one in the top, helps us achieve 32 async ports as built-in interfaces capable in this one RE form factor. And it also comes up with one more NIM module slot. So this 32 port terminal server helps you to get the built-in ports, which can be directly used for connecting uh, to the consoles via the async cables. The one in the, uh, in the middle of this slide the second box that you see, which also has Ethernet ports inbuilt. This comes with a switch module of 24 port, again built-in switch module, along with the 32 async port, and is quite capable of doing two tasks. One, to access the devices using console, and the second one, to use the management Ethernet type of connectivity functions, the TFTP operations that we do using management connectivity and things like that. All of that, management port termination also is achieved within the same box, which acts as a terminal server and also acts as your management Ethernet connectivity port. So this actually, the second box I'm talking here, takes the terminal server to the next level because ideally we used to have two different devices, one to connect to the, uh, to the terminals uh, in terms of console connectivity using async ports, and we used to have a separate dedicated device like a switch or something to connect to the management Ethernet connectivity. With this 1100 terminal server, we call it as terminal gateway also, that's why the TG naming there, the C1100 TG. With this inbuilt 24 port switch module, we are bringing in the togetherness of both things done, like the terminal connectivity, as well as the management Ethernet connectivity within the same box reduces one device from your top of rack solution. Isn't it exciting? Yes, I, I believe so. What comes extra and what comes added on top of what you see here from port connectivity point of view? It supports the secure tunnel connectivity. You in this cloud scale network uh, environments, you might want to have these terminal servers which are key endpoint to the devices, you might, you might want to make sure that all the traffic want, goes in securely. Even if it's accessing console, even if it's management related activity, you want all that traffic also to be accessing securely through the, the place that you are sitting in from or trying to access it from. All that is possible with this extra support of IPsec, GRE, and DMVPN type of traditional VPN technologies in this, this particular platform. And 
the the benefits that you also get is the LTE capable. LTE access is also on the roadmap. You can put a LTE NIM module in there, which you can just put in 4G or 5G SIM card, and you are you don't really need an uplink in the form of Ethernet. Just just put access it via the LTE as a backup or as a primary going forward. This is a quick tabular representation of the hardware resources, the next generation terminal server platform software. So firstly, we discussed about 32 ports which are coming in built-in async ports, but you also can have an async NIM module inserted to get additional 16 ports into that via the NIM slot. The without switch module, the default one, the 1N32A, that comes with 2GB RAM and 4GB boot flash. The with built-in module, there are two variants, and this is the third variant that I was talking about. If you notice, the second column, uh, or the third column, so to say, has 1N24P32A naming convention, which stands for one NIM module, 24 switch ports, and 32 async ports. Let me just get the laser enabled so that you can see what I'm talking about. This is what I was hinting on. One NIM module, 24 Ethernet ports, built-in ports, and 30 async ports. The second platform naming convention just adds an X here. It says 1100TGX, and then 1N24 port, 32 async port. The X is an indication that this comes with higher memory, like 8GB memory variations, whereas the non-X module comes with 4GB DRAM and default 4GB flash variation. This memory provisioning has been done for special purposes. Like somebody wants to do something, um, for example, an app hosting or some security related applications so, uh, hosted on that part. So we are just keeping the flexibility of uh, that future enablement in terms of what new use case might get developed. The hardware is capable of supporting that with the added, added memory resources. The important points to note, this architecture is based on the NIM ES2 architecture, uh, wherein the NIM specific architecture that our existing SR portfolio offers. This switch uses third party ASIC. NGIO light access is enabled for switch ports to be connect able to connect to the forwarding plane of the particular device. And the cable, uh, async cables are standard async cables uh, where the, the PID also called as CAB async 8. Yes, so with this introduction to our hardware, hardware offering as part of 17.2.1 iOS XE, let's get into the main topic of today's session, which is single image and plug and play solution that it comes along with. Are you wondering what exactly is single image? What is this? Is this a new name that Cisco wants to call to the iOS? Um, like say we had iOS, we had iOS XE after that, we do have iOS XR type of OS on core Cisco routing portfolio. Are you wondering is single image a new thing, a new OS type? Okay, let me park that question a bit. As you know today, we do have enterprise routing portfolio, which is used for iOS XE use case, the traditional routing use cases, and also the iOS XE SD-WAN use cases. The iOS XE use cases are offered via universal K9 image, if you know the exact image type that it comes with. And for SD-WAN use cases, we offer them using UCM K9 image. With 17.2.1R, these two are going to get combined in one single entity. The code base for iOS XE use case and iOS XE SD-WAN use case is getting merged in the single form factor, single image, single binary, and that's why we just simply called it a single image of type universal K9. As you got a hint that both code bases are getting merged into single entity, that means we have to tweak the image operation into autonomous mode when we want to get the iOS specific use cases enabled on that particular device. And you, when you want to use the SD-WAN use cases, you have to get into the controller mode of operation for the same functionality in the SD-WAN mode now. So that's what single images in a quick gist. Let's get into the more details. 
one important thing that you want to note is a fresh installation that means a new router and when it's installed with 17.2.1 image for the first time it's going to come up in autonomous mode that means first installation fresh install of this device no running configuration available on the platform nothing fresh factory installation is always going to be autonomous mode where it's ready for serving iOS XE use cases. When I have to get the device enabled for SD-WAN use case, we need to change the mode of operation from controller mode, uh, from autonomous mode to the controller mode. Because controller mode is what which helps serve the iOS XE SD-WAN use cases. This can be achieved manually with a simple CLI in the exact form. You do say controller FN mode and question mark, you can enable it using the enable keyword. That means you're migrating from autonomous mode to the controller mode, SD-WAN mode. You can disable it when you are in SD-WAN mode and then simply come back to autom autonomous mode to serve iOS X use cases. This is an exec CLI supported in both the mode of operation. But what happens when you do, say, controller mode enable? First thing, the device may prompt the user if there is any configuration previous there on the device. Uh, in SD-WAN mode point of view, then the device may ask whether you want to use anything from the old configuration which is existing in the boot flash. Because if you know the controller mode or the SD-WAN mode specific configurations are stored into the boot flash entity and not NVRAM. The iOS XE configurations, they are the ones which are like the startup, .conf, uh, startup config, they are used and stored in the NVRAM mode. So that's the that's key difference of how this config management happens, right? Either in SD-WAN use case versus the iOS XE use case. So when you have to get from iOS XE autonomous mode to the controller mode, you do say controller mode enable. You can install the previously available configuration from config database in the boot flash of that device, or you can come up with day zero mode provisioning. Day zero meaning fresh install for SD-WAN use case. So, the device, the, the, the device change, uh, just say controller mode disable and it will refer the startup configuration when it boots up into the autonomous mode. Only thing, whenever this mode change is happening, either from autonomous to controller or controller to autonomous, there are some important settings that needs to be done in the data path, in the microcode of that particular device. And the image today with 17.2 implementation reloads and gets into the ne gets into the necessary settings that are required for the target move. I hope that is clear. Let's now understand what is greenfield and brownfield image upgrade scenario. So what I'm talking is he here is not a, not a deployment scenario like greenfield deployment or brownfield deployment, but what I'm talking is from image upgrade point of view. So if I am installing 17.2.1R image in my existing deployment, either it's iOS XE or iOS XE SDWAN, that would be my brownfield use case scenario, where I have pre previously provisioned the device for my iOS XE use case or SDWAN use case, and I just want to upload, up, upgrade to 17.2 code. That's brownfield. And what's going to happen in the brownfield? It's going to be a seamless upgrade for phones. There is no disturbance to the existing configuration all the configuration for iOS XC specific use case will get referred from the startup config. Device will come up directly into autonomous mode and all startup config gets reprogrammed into the 17.2.1 variation of this image install. Same thing for iOS XC SD-WAN use case. Again, seamless upgrade, no disturbance to the existing configuration. The device will refer to the default configuration that it's set as part of the config DB settings in the iOS XE SD-WAN use case. And it refer to that config and create a directory for 17.2 specific config DB entities and come up in the controller mode to serve SD-WAN use cases. So Brownfield is going to be split for both use cases. Let's look at what's going to happen for Greenfield image upgrade scenario in iOS XE use case. As you know, by default, device comes in autonomous mode when you boot with single image. That means here also the same thing will happen. A fresh device, fresh router, there's no configuration provision in my start config. Device comes up in autonomous mode 
and waits there for day zero provisioning. They're going to look at what provisioning methods like the PP, the manual, the bootstrap in upcoming slides. But just a key takeaway here for Greenfield iOS X use case, device will come up in autonomous mode and wait for the zero provisioning. For the Greenfield SD-WAN use case, this is where it's a little tricky. First, the default mode is autonomous mode. Then we have to agitate the device either with the help of PNP manual trigger of that CLI that we discussed in the last slide, or the bootstrap configuration or trigger to help the device understand that it needs to serve as the use case. This is a fresh device. Okay, you came up in autonomous mode by default, but now you have to actually serve as the use cases. So that's what we do with the help of this PNP manual or bootstrap based trigger. We are going to look into detail of that. And as soon as the trigger happens, the code automatically detects it and gets into controller mode with a second reboot. That's where it's ready for day zero provisioning in SD-WAN mode now, either by a PV or manual or CLIV. Okay, so let's get into the details of what happens in case of downgrade, right? The downgrade for iOS XE, SD, uh, iOS XE use case, which is our traditional routing use case, from 17.2 code to anything older, either 17.1 code or 16.12 code, all of that is going to be seamless because in iOS XC mode, you just refer the entire Don't have to worry about configuration uh, database in case, like in SD-WAN case. You don't have to worry about running that is there in SD-WAN use case. You just rely on NVRAM config and come up. So that's why the there is no caveat, though there is no point that we need to be attentive when we are downgrading from 17.2 to anything older in iOS XE use case. But when we are doing the same for SD-WAN use case, like downgrading from 17.2 to, to the old code, we need to be very much aware, and this is, this is not necessarily a, something that comes up with single image. It's actually a fact even in today's SD-WAN deployments where you need to be aware of what is my installed versions on that device. So if suppose I come uh, upgrade from 16.12 code to 17.2 code uh, to, to you know, use a new feature and things like that, and eventually in the future, if I want to roll back to 16.12 uh, code, I need to make sure that I do not delete the old uh, installed version. If I delete that 16.12 version when I have upgraded to 17.2, for example, we may lose the opportunity to be able to roll back to the old configuration. Because if there is no configuration data available, when you delete it in for say 16.12, you will not be able to roll back to that version which is a fact today. So this is one consideration to keep the downgrade options open. Uh, it is wise to really keep one uh, last installed software version database available till we are fully uh, good to go with the test code of 17.2 or any any the latest code. Yeah, so from sd point of view, yeah, now that every release version or whatever install code that you will be installing on the device will have a versioning that is going to be kept into the device uh, because that specific release related configuration is stored in that boot flash access, not in the NVRAM, right? In the controller mode operations. So what we do here is we do have this install requirements based on the single image, um, wherein the minimum 700 MB space should be available for the first time conversion of autonomous mode to controller mode. So this 700 MB is like a max, um, minimum uh, available because we, we we might need it for creating those extra directories, for uh, creating those directories to you know have the versioning specific configuration enabled and provisioned into the boot flash because controller mode uh, configurations are all going to be stored in boot flash. So that's minimum requirement for the first time install. When I have it already provisioned in controller mode and I keep changing, uh, I install a new code or something, what I need is minimum 300 MB uh, free space in boot flash just to accommodate the new directory that we may want to create for this new version of software that you're installing on the existing sd -WAN use case. So uh, uh, when we talk about this minimum requirement, it's just the boot flash that we're talking about, but space related, understanding and then the needs that we come when we talk about controller based devices or the S -Gen type of devices that's where we want to limit the maximum two installations for uh, sub, uh, support as such for every device we do, we do not want to really keep on doing multiple installations like say 16.12 16.11 i do have 16.10 i want to keep everything but that's unnecessarily wasting of the memory in the boot flash which is vital uh, resource for hardware 
So we may want to really, at this moment, we are trying to maximize that installation for maximum two. So apart from this, a minimum considerations, you do get a notification in terms of what in current mode the image is installed in. A simple show platform software device mode will tell you the operating mode of current installation, either you are in controller mode or autonomous mode uh, on that particular device. You also get a boot five op mode log, uh, syslog message, which comes in the boot up sequence, which will tell you what the system is booting into because all the settings which are essential for setting a microcode and things like that in the data path control plane for sd when use case or iOS use case, everything is happening while the device is booting. So with the single image. So this is also an important key indication what the device is booting into. We do have the show version, uh, uh, obviously with the basic command that we use to check anything from iOS installation point of view. This tells you where the device is booted in, in controller mode or autonomous mode as well. Okay, with that, let's see what's there with legacy bootstrap configuration. I, I'm sure that most of you will be aware of what bootstrap configuration is. Basically, the word bootstrap itself, as you see, right, you are doing something at the boot event of that particular device, right? It might be hinting on that. Let me add some more clarity. What we do here, we give a reference configuration file to the device from any associated resource repository, either it's USB, either it's boot flash, or something of that sort, which is accessible for the device or the iOS when the device is booting. And these files are usually kept in .cfg uh, as, a, as a extension. So you see here the Cisco RTR.cfg, which is the file naming that we use for OSXE autonomous mode use case. Cisco SDVAN cloud init.cfg or Cisco SDVAN.cfg, these are the files, again, having the extension as .cfg, but they are intended for bootstrap provisioning of SDVAN use cases. So what exactly happens in this bootstrap provisioning is the .cfg file hosts the required configuration or the required details about that SD-WAN overlay specific uh, entities like org name, vbond and all that. Those important details which are needed for the device to come up with a certain configuration, those are there present in this particular file. So for example, and as simple as that, like see, you can just copy your running configuration and put it in Cisco RT.cfg for iOS 6 use case and that becomes a reference of what I need to provision the device with. As soon as the iOS boots up from Ramon and gets into the iOS, uh, iOS XE level of booting, it tries to check if I have any .cfg files listed in my USB, in my bootstrap, uh, boot flash, to understand if it's boot with bootstrap configuration. That's how the bootstrap part comes in. So then if it detects any .cfg file, uh, for, then it's going to, iOS is going to learn the configuration from that, learn the overly specific configuration in case of SD-WAN use case from that, and do the full to in the further use case for that device. And the fact that most of our enterprise routing platforms offers a USB port built in for most of the chases, this enables us to have such bootstrap kind of configurations just placed in a text file uh, for iOS 6 use cases in form of Cisco RTR.cfg and connect it to the front panel of the USB port of the router and turn on the router. While the image boots up, it detects that and can boot directly without you trying to access the console even. You don't even have to access console in such cases if the configuration is correct, right? So all these are the benefits of legacy bootstrap wave configuration and we do carry forward all of those goodness with single image. It supports bootstrapping the device in autonomous mode as well as controller mode. In case of controller mode, one key difference is for all the devices which do not have the trustworthy systems to authenticate the serial number and the authenticity of the hardware or the virtual form factors like CSR and ISR devices, ISR 1KV, CSR 1KV, all those virtual devices and the version 2X kind of ASR device which does not have TPM chip, those will be authenticated with a token ID that we get from vManage from the controller, right? But all this is done securely, even if it's controller driven. And in case of 
iOS XE autonomous mode, that is done based on the running configuration that you are directing as part of the .cfg file. Okay, so we get the boot flash, uh, bootstrapping. We get the PNP as well, which we're going to look into further slides in a detailed way. But these are all the image types that are touched based on the single image implementation. So as you might have got a hint that we are doing single image, the basic motive was to get iOS XE traditional routing and iOS XE SD-WAN supported via same binary software, right? That was the main motive. So all the platforms which support use cases for SD-WAN as well as iOS XE will have single image implementation. The platforms like ASR 1000 modular platform, where RP, RP3 type of hardware um, sits in, in modular chassis, those images are, we do not support SD-WAN and that's where we kind of not touching anything from single image implementation point of view in those modular platforms. Apart from this, the no payload encryption, no of chip, NPE, NOLI, these special type of images, which are again related to the traditional routing use cases and not in a given use case. All of them also are untouched for all the platforms applicably. Please feel free to post your questions in the question forum. We do have Kureli and Pradeep to help you answer and we can take the questions if we get some time as well in the end. Uh, yes, but any so of these topics. There was a question that was posted for the particular mm -hmm. slide that you have right now by Alexi, so I, I did post a response and I also mentioned that the current slide also explains. And the question was, NP image doesn't include crypto by definition, so SD-WAN won't work. So yes. if there will be a controller mode in the NP image, even if it is it'll not useless, be. right? It, it will not be. Yes, Thank it'll you. not be. It, it applies for NP, it applies for no lawful intercept, intercept and also NP and OLI. All these three image types are not supported on SD-WAN use case today, so we did not really touch them. So let's look into the, the benefits or the automation capabilities that single image is going to give us, right? Uh, we did not attempt just combining or merging two codes as is, right? We had a thought that went in in this software orchestration. Or orchestration. There was a deep understanding of why we need to be fully automatable, and you're going to get a glimpse of all that when we discuss the PMP. Firstly, let's discuss about how the image boots up, what's changing. Our goal was to make sure that the PNP type of plug and play automation to, boot, uh, to, to have the devices booted as well as provisioned without any, anybody trying to access the console or things like that. No staging type of activities where a device gets pre-programmed in somewhere in the data center or the network admin lab and then it gets sent to the site, remote site. All of that traditional way is getting faded now. We have the, the benefits like Cisco plug and play offering where the smart account can talk to your device after the device is turned on and it gets on internet. Those are trying to be, uh, tried to be made autonomous in both use cases. Like we wanted to have the autonomous single image mode as well as the a controller single image mode both run efficiently for this PNP. So that seamlessness gives us the benefits of what we are going to deep dive now. A quick glimpse, we are going to look into the flow chart of what happens when the device boots up using single image. Firstly, you know that the device comes up in autonomous mode and there is a part of code that we call it as PNP agent plug and play agent, that code starts. The goal of this particular code entity is to determine who or how I can provision myself. The device or the iOS is trying to detect that portion of it. As we discussed the bootstrap configuration, that's one of the key thing that the device looks for. It looks for any .cfg files as we discussed, either in the boot flash, either in your virtual CD-ROMs or things like that for virtual devices, or in the USB device as well. It will look for any .cfg files to provision bootstrap way of configuration, which is the second option here. But after that, it will also invoke something called as con call home feature, you might be well aware of, which is related to the plug and play orchestration. This call home feature can redirect. Firstly, it tries to contact Cisco's dhl.cisco.com. 
it happens for IL-6 use case as well, where it might be getting redirected to the DNAC or NSO type of controller. Or it happens in the SD-WAN use case also, where it redirects to the V-Bond controller profile. So who redirects it? First thing is the device talks to the devicehelper.cisco.com, which is Cisco's cloud-hosted um, uh, the portal of smart, which we also call is our smart the virtual account from our use case point of view. We will de de uh, look into that in a separate slide as well. But what we have there, we do have a dedicated controller profile assigned for each serial number of the device, which has the controller profile has details about the V bond and org name for that is the or for iOS use case, it will have the details about an IP address or HTTPS path for DNAC or NSO type of controller orchestrator. That controller profile is a key guidance for the device. After it reaches to the device helper, authenticates itself with the TM suit related details that we have. And then the, the, the device helper.cisco.com, okay, okay, this is a right device. It has a valid TPM or um, trustworthy system installed in it based on the SUDI details that it cross verifies. Only after that security hurdle is passed, then only the controller, either is DNAC or NSO or the VBOND, that profile which is attached by the network I mean, in the smart account or virtual account, that will be given to the device. So the device now knows who is my VBOND controller and that's where the redirection part comes in. So the the device helper.cisco.com redirects after successful TPM authentication for the device to the specific PNP controller that the admin may have attached. We will look into that detail in the demo as well. Then you do have PNP stopped. Okay, somebody wants to provision the device manually using console in autonomous mode. What happens as soon as you get into config mode is uh, in the autonomous mode of the console. The device or software thinks that, okay, somebody is provisioning me manually, so I do not have to look for configuration outside. Let me get provisioned manually, and that's the assumption code does, and PNP stop at that moment. So another thing is if there is nothing of this happening, like there's no PNP redirection happening either for VBOND or DNP, no bootstrap available, config available in any storage devices, or even nobody tried to do access the device and configure it. None of this happened. In that case, the device will still continue waiting in this PNP state machine to understand the day zero provisioning options that may get populated, like somebody attaches a controller profile after the device is already turned on. Eventually, it will come back to the one of these four parts. So non -day, uh, PNP day zero is where it, it will keep on waiting on that part. Let's assume that device got the bootstrap in the form of Cisco SDVN.CFG. Yes, okay, I have to then, as soon as it detects that, that means I cannot stay in autonomous mode because I have the config file for SD-WAN modes. So it reloads itself and comes up in controller mode. So the image intelligent, once it, this is the trigger part, right? This is the trigger part of telling the device to get into controller mode because by default it has come into autonomous mode, ready to survive six use case. When we have to have SD-WAN use case to be served on that device, you just have to trigger it in the right way, either this way or by redirection from the right controller profile in the PNP portal. As soon as that redirection happens, it reloads, or if it finds a config file in SD-WAN mode, it reloads and comes up in controller mode. Similarly, for iOS XE use case, as we discussed, somebody configuring it manually via config wizard iOS CLI in autonomous mode, or somebody having a Cisco rtr.cfg type of file uh, for bootstrap or say for example redirects to the nso happens successfully from Cisco smart account all that can trigger to the autonomous mode where it doesn't have to reload because it's already in autonomous mode it continues to stay in autonomous mode and get provision as per guidance that it receives so everything is made automatic none of this process apart from setting the right controller profile in the smart account uh, and turning of device none of this really needs anybody to intervene and you know configure the device or like you have to be in the console to get the image work no it's it's going to be, be very much uh, synonymous in both modes and this will help 
the today demands for network automation from in, starting from provisioning and anything after that, you have it covered. Okay, I am sure there is a lot of data being shared at this moment, but please be rest assured the next few slides will tell you. I'll reiterate some of these facts that we are discussing so that your concepts get clear in this. Yes, let's look at what happens from the ordering point of view. Like say we order the device in CCW, which is Cisco's ordering portal. The user or the customer service provider whoever is purchasing the device orders, puts an order, selects for example, as thousand dice per particular portfolio, and then it has his own smart account login details that he specifies while ordering. Every customer has a smart account. If it's a service provider, they have a virtual account for every individual customer that they, they might be selling the device. Or if it's a partner that they might be selling uh, the device to some other customers, end customers, they will have individual virtual accounts. The only thing that the user has to do while ordering is attach to the right smart account or the right virtual account while ordering that particular device. What happens after that? This correct attachment of the smart account the backend automation, as soon as the device gets ready in the factory, it gets shipped by the Cisco's logistics team to the, to the customer address. At that moment, we have the details about the serial number of device. We have the details about the TPM authentication, the SUDI details for that device. All of that gets populated automatically in the account or the virtual account the device has got. That happens automatically. That's why it's important to really specify the correct smart account or correct virtual account for where the device is going to get, you know, shipped to the end customer. If it, in case of service provider or partner scenarios, or customer himself offering, we have to make sure that the correct smart account is provisioned here. That really helps to set the background automation and put the device serial number into the correct smart account. Then the device list is passed there. What the user does is. The user configures the current controller profile and all that in the smart account. But then this list for that controller profile based on say your PNP or uh, cloud uh, service, if you have the any associated SD-WAN overlay, for example, or DNAC type of overlay, that's where, or even if NSO type of situation, those details from the smart account for that particular device are passed to the specific controller profile that the user will attach in the smart account. So that means your device helper.cisco.com has all these details and attached controller profile. This is where the vbond controller profile gets added by the user or the network admin for that device. So because now the okay, this is the serial number which is bought. Cisco has already done this, and then now I need to attach a controller profile. I know which is my vbond address and the organization for SDN overlay. All that gets tagged here. Once that's done, the admin fetch these details automatically from cloud to cloud communication and we manage in the cloud or on-prem as well, having internet access, fetch the data from PNP portal from the specific smart account using the sync smart button on the devices tab on we manage. So you don't have to really upload any file of serial numbers of devices and SUDI manually. This all gets automatically done. So the benefits of giving the right smart account or virtual account here at the ordering stage really helps you to do all this and save the manual work of passing, a, uploading, a, say, for example, a smart sheet or something, having the list of serial numbers, making sure that it's all correct and all. All of that gets automatically done if we just do the right thing at the first place of ordering, right? Then, the vManage can push it to the v and vSmart controllers with push device list or the send to controller option in the device, uh, vManage dashboard. Now you are all set. At this moment, for sd use case, we are all set for onboarding that device. What you just need to do is turn on the device at the specific target location where you want to put provision that edge router. You just have to connect it to the internet. As soon as the device boots up with single image, First thing it's going to do is, as we discussed in the last slide, it is going to start the PNP agent, which tries to connect to devicehelper.sys.com. As soon as it gets here, authenticates itself with the TPM and other authentication, the cloud-hosted smart account PNP portal redirects to the right vBond profile to the device. That's where the device contacts to the vBond, 
gets booted into controller mode and then gets provisioned via VMH for the specific configuration you want to do. All of this happens automatically. One thing that helps from all this backend back automation that quality has, and the second half of the thing gets help with the single image orchestration. First, boots into autonomous mode, gets into this PNP portal, gets authenticated via reboots into controller mode automatically. You don't have to do anything. And comes up in controller mode, gets provision from vManage, end to automation. So this is how things go hand in hand. We are going to summarize what we learned in last two slides. Just focus on one key thing. You know that single image works in two modes. One is autonomous mode, second is controller mode. Read these arrows of next flow that's going to pop up. The blue arrow will tell you that device is still in autonomous mode, which is the default mode. As soon as it changes to the orange arrow, that means the device self detected the mode that it needs to provision SD WAN. And that's the only time when it will change to the mode and get into the controller mode transition. So all the transitions you will see with orange arrow will be when the device is already got into the controller mode. So this is the stage one. Somebody did order it, provided the right virtual account or smart account. PP automation and the smart account automation configured the right V bond related details or the in, in this place, you can also have a DNAC type of NSO type of orchestrator also. You just have to make sure that you provision the right controller profile in the PNP portal for your account. That's it. All of this is stage one. You turn on the device. This is where the single image work starts. Comes up in autonomous mode. PNP agent starts. Blue arrow, again, device is still in autonomous mode. Connects to portal. Authenticates the TP. Make sure that it has that controller profile there. Is there a controller profile related to SD-WAN? No, there is no profile for SD-WAN. There may be a case that there is a profile for ISXC controller, which can be an SO or DNAC. In that case as well, device will come up in autonomous mode and get provisioned the right way, either via CLI or via the DNA type of provision way. Let's look at SD-WAN mode in more detail, right? So this is all, we are still in aut uh, autonomous mode. You see, you notice the arrow is still blue. Still blue, you want, it detects that as soon as the PNP portal is done, it detects that, okay, yes, I have a clear v bond related detail. That's when it detects, okay, I have to come, mode change and reboot. That's where the device gets auto, auto triggers the mode change from autonomous mode to controller mode. You don't have to execute that CLI. You don't have to do any other automation. Only thing is that trigger has to happen via PNP in this case. PNP agent starts now, but in revan mode. It again contacts to the PNP portal, authenticates the serial number. So this is the flow that works in today's 1612 or any older code for PAP automation. The same thing will start now, but in SDVAN mode. Gets authenticated, gets provisioned, detects a VBond profile again, contacts the VBond again, in controller mode and gets provisioned completely from vManage. Okay, so from CCW ordering point of view, everything stays same. There's nothing changing in CCW ordering. You just have to check uh, the right software version. If you are using it for the controller mode, you have to take it UCM9 version. The SKUs are still same. It will be 17.2 code in that case. And uh, for uh, iOS access case, you will be using the universal K9 in this other case. Okay, let's have a quick poll. What PNP and ZTP solutions you have used till now? With Cisco vManage, with TNAC, with NSO type of network orchestrator, or Bootstrap? We have 20 seconds, I guess. Lots of people have used 16% almost the Bootstrap side. That's good to know. Once you see the demo for the PNP now, you are going to get more confident on how you can do the same thing using PNP ways. Let's look into that. Yeah, here it comes. So as we discussed, the user orders and corrects the ads to the color profile. We are going to do a quick demo where you will see what a PNP device can be provisioned in a SD-WAN use case. So we are going to have this particular serial number. Just note the last digits, PWB, and the device is 721. That is an ISR that you see in the picture. It just has an LTE module, um, a single uh, 4G LTE SIM. 
and it's sitting in the one of friends house I wish we help with the demo video and we do have a serial number that you see here so this is the serial number of the device which uh, we are going to attach a controller profile in the virtual account then we are going to get the smart account sync done from vManage pre-provision the device and then we are going to turn on the device using the LTA same so basically we are provisioning the device already in the as uh, in the uh, vManage and then the device gets turned on gets contacted with uh, the PNP portal and gets provisioned this is what we are going to see in the next slide so here it starts this is uh, the software.cisco.com window where you can go and look into the PNP connect portal as you see in the center there here you can add the devices that you want to add ideally if the device is ordered using the correct we manage correct we uh, virtual account of the smart account you will see that the device list will be already populated here as soon as it gets from the factory otherwise you can do this option where you add it manually either with the help of a csv file here we are working with one device so we are going to do it manually with one cell. you add the device put the exact product name serial number the seven us that we saw on the slide that's the serial number we are adding here and the 1120 by x sr1k this is an LTE capable ISR that we are adding. And we are selecting a controller profile, Riptela Cloud Hosted Profile. This profile has all the de detail for the vBond and vManage for the, the demo uh, setup that we have. So as you noticed, we added the device. It will populate all the SUDI related details on its own. We say submit. successfully added so now the redirection is pending what we are going to do is in the vManage as I said you can fetch this detail automatically from vManage so this is our vManage for the device there is no device added as you might have noticed vManage list is zero it's all right. We just have one vSmart, one vBond, no vanage at this moment. Our end goal is to see a device getting added here automatically without we doing anything uh, as configuring it or things like that. So everything is going to work via PNP orchestration for provisioning this new device. We go to the device list. There is uh, no device here with our 1121X as you see as of now. So no profile on that. <coughs> We say sync to smart account. So this is where that automatic authentication happens. You, your vManage dashboard will talk now to the PNP portal, the first tab where we added the device. It will get the device list sync. Happens pretty quickly. It's just one device at this moment. Sometimes it will take time if there is a huge list of devices getting populated, but not much time. Then we do send that details. So as soon as we saw the device populated, sending it to the vBond, we manage uh, vBond and vSmart, uh, vSmart as well. Done. So now we are all ready from the controller's point of view. What we have to do is we have to attach the C1121X as you see the new device getting added. We have to attach the right template configuration for this device. And that's what we're going to do now. So you got the chassis number, everything is populated correctly. So this is a pre-populated template that I have, the last one, XC4G LTE. It's all the details that are needed based, based on the cellular interface, because here the cellular LTE 4G interface is going to be our main VPN interface. As you see, XC cellular interface, that's the VPN zero profile that we have configured. Everything else is pretty simple. We are going to have NAT on that particular device, which is a part of the cellular controller configuration as well. Now we attach that device template to the device. Okay, these are regular steps. Um, most of you who are familiar with vManage will be aware of this. 
we give a host name and other details. You can do this um, if there are multiple devices. All of this can be automated with the help of provisioning files as well in the form of uh, Excel sheets like that. Now we are pre-provisioning the device. At this moment, device is not yet on, right? As we discussed in the flow before this demo. So this is a configuration that's going to get pre-provisioned. It will stay in vManage. Only thing is, once the device contacts it, then it will get configured. So this is a quick way to verify it uh, on the vManage on what configuration is going to go. So it says it's scheduled, right? That means it's getting provisioned. There is no active device at this moment. So it will stay scheduled. <coughs> so it says it's contacted, right? That's when a sync smart account was executed and the redirection happened. So till now you see the devices are still turned on. At this moment, when I refresh it, the edge got provisioned. And how this happened is the same way where you see the control logs here on the device which was turned on. The router started booted with 17.2 on our image. Nothing you are doing manually because they remember if you do uh, configure, uh, try to configure something, it's booted in autonomous mode. If you configure something at this stage using accessing the console, device will think that you are willing to provision it manually. It will not do PNP after that. So you just have to keep it as is, let it get booted and provision completely. This is where the PNP discovery starts after the device is completely booted. The device contacts devicehelper.cisco.com. Then the mode change related aspect happens because you have a right rebound profile. So you have to come up into controller mode now. All that happens. And you see that there is a reload requested to enable the controller mode. This all happens automatically. Nobody has to do it manually like initiating the controller mode change. After this, the device boots again, but this time in controller mode. <clears throat> okay, with the time that we have, I guess I may have to move faster. As you see, the device got booted successfully in controller mode. Um, let me halt this demo here because I guess the gist of the demo is done already to save on time. But if the demo is built there, have a look at it. So let's have a quick look at the feature summary. I believe you got a clear understanding of what single image is, what are the benefits in terms of automation going to get and all. But also this is a list of quick features that are also coming as part of 17.2.1R. We do have a variety of them in VPN technology, security, voice, layer two. Let's have a look at it one by one and the supported platforms are listed as well. So MPLS P node support, prior to 17.2, DMVPN folks were not able to, uh, could only act as a CE or PE device on the overlay. The MPLS P node was limited to the spoke or hub topology only. The multi tenant because of this, the multi-tenant and the MSP type of deployments with the full-fledged MPLS S3 VPN network behind the spoke could, not, could only be used in hub and spoke and on spoke topology. So what happens with this is, we are adding the support for MPLS P node for DMVPN spoke as well. For direct spoke to spoke communication without next stop reservation. So that's a benefit that you get here. For scale and performance point of view, the numbers would be similar to what we support on the current use cases for DMVPN with MPLS. The key thing here is the NHRP LUNT, uh, with this, the NHRP redirection gets stack switched all the way to the far end PE kind of spoke. This helps to achieve the, the end goal of uh, supporting this MPLS P node functionality for DMVPN and by avoiding that next stop preservation as such. These are having, we have detailed notes about this on how and what part of configuration. So there are FII slides for configuration examples. Feel free to have a look at that. 
the get vpn fail close revert is another fe feature where you know a key a registration failure can actually start dropping the traffic we are adding the fail close revert keyword which will help user to not uh, to also operate in fail close mode or also fail open policy mode when there is a key registration failing with the key server in that case the device will fall back to the old uh, a local policy if it is configured if there is no local pol policy configured and the group member it will operate in open mode so it's just an addition of that revert keyword but that helps the to avoid this traffic drop when the key registration is failing for gate vpn that's a key takeaway again the fyi slides which will hint you on the config and other details i quickly wanted to run uh, run down through the the spare features and that's why these slides are here um, because the main station was anyway split. So in this feature for 6VP over DMVP and over IPv6 transport, earlier we used to support uh, the IPv6 LAN extension for L3VPN over DMVPN for only IPv4 transport as such. With this release, it gets supported for IPv6 core network as well. Again, the scale numbers are not much back. It's all going to be almost the same as we support for this use case earlier. The sample configurations. In case of security, we are adding the support for MaxSec on the port channel interfaces on ASR 1000 platform. You just have to configure MaxSec over all members of that port channel interface. That's it. So it actually works on the member link level from configuration and MaxSec feature point of view. But now it, it can be enabled for interfaces or member links which are part of port channel. So you get additional layer one level security for the communication between port and links with this support. For voice, a lot of improvements in voice side also these days. We do have the CPA algorithm enhancements done to help encounter background noise in the better way, to improve the speech detection with live signal to noise ratio monitoring. And overall, it's going to have the CPA detection rate improved by 4% with this enhancement. These are all independent of the user access. Basically, the experience will improve, but there isn't CLI configuration or things like that required for this feature. In layer two, a specific offering for all the LAN interfaces that are supported on ISR 1000 and ISR 4000 platforms, we are adding the RTP v3 support, uh, which was there for uh, the WAN interfaces before, but in this release, we are adding it on all applicable L2 LAN ports as well for ISR platforms. Here is also a sample configuration slide. We do have details on another feature for layer two, which is protocol tuning, layer two protocol tuning. So these are all the control packets which are usually part of your L2 network. But in, a, in case of MSP type of scenario or service scenario, when a customer wants to carry this uh, L2 control traffic across the WAN <coughs> via uh, the WAN network as such, possible with L2PT feature here, layer two protocol tunneling. Um, it is again supported on all the ISR and a ISR 1000 and 4000 uh, ports as such. Layer three IP multiplexing, another crucial feature for two network environments where, you know, if there is a congestion or it's per second limitation on the path, we have, we are getting back the, uh, the support for IP multiplexing feature. Where a small packets will be multiplexed together at the source to, to be sent to the same destination. We call it as a frame. And at the destination, that demultiplexing happens where the small packets gets um, reassembled into packet flows and will be sent to the host, right? So that helps to avoid a considerable amount of packet processing on the path as such. And such uh, congestion situations can be handled well by implementing this. However, a catch there is this is a costly feature on data path, right? super frame creation and you know demultiplexing that at the remote. So it, we have to be a little wise in terms of enabling this for only specific scenarios. For example, in this use case, we are showing the IP phone, or the RTP packet force only handled via this and all of the traffic is all handled normally. <coughs> yeah, so do have slides in terms of configuration here as well. The network management point of view, we are supporting SNMP MIPS for today's cloud scale networks where you have a lot of VRF or VNI type of network configurations or your routers, for example, ASR1K used as a cloud uh, endpoint at such, where you may have this uh, VXLAN happening uh, to the cloud 
so are your network and things like that um, in multiple vrf multiple vni scenarios and if you want to account all of the traffic going through that you can do that with this mip support again do have detailed configuration guides for all these features that are getting added feel free to grab the do the details so you do have reference slides here as well at the end of this deck uh, but here, uh 69 partial configuration download functionality is also added for dsl cp use cases where somebody wants to partially provision the device part of automation again not full provisioning things like that can be handled well with this kind of uh, download rpc method use case on dsl environment we are also adding one important transceiver to help people migrate towards 40 gig and 100 gig connectivity using existing LC type of network infra cabling infrastructure that they may already have. This QSFP module can work in both 40 gig as well as 100 gig mode and can help serve on the existing LC type of connectors, MMF type of cables, um, just by replacing the end port modules. It's supported on IS, uh, ASR 1000 EPAs and the 40 gig interfaces and 100 gig interfaces. <laughs> A quick look at other features. We do have these are small features. That's so just a quick look. We are supporting Cube on ISR 4461 starting this release 1721 R. ISR 1000 gets a reset button functionality. Uh, the front panel reset function can help you direct the device to golden config file. There can be a file named as golden.cfg on your boot flash, which can be your type of configuration and if you lose the configuration or password or things like that just pressing this reset button can help you put the device with the golden config then we are adding some enhanced bias level protections as well to improve the security at the boot level we are also adding cisco ssl 17 uh, 7.1 support basically open dot open ssl 111c supported from this release we have detailed slides. Again, a lot of documentation on Cisco.com. Notes are available. Feel free to look into it, and we will be able to answer the questions as well. With that, a quick poll again. Which solution would be most ideal for your enterprise? PNP using Cisco vManage, ZTP using Cisco DNAC, ZTP using Cisco Network Services Orchestrator, or Bootstrap. Uh, Hilda, the poll started. I don't see that yet. It's quite exciting that this automation capability is inbuilt in the iOS as well as the uh, cloud infrastructure that we have from vManage or the, the network uh, services orchestration or DNSC type of controllers. And on the other side, the Cisco smart account or virtual account related cloud portals, which help you to maneuver both starting from ordering till the provisioning of that device and going forward, right? So it's it's interesting that the provisioning is getting complete automated now, and it will go to the next stages as we evolve. Nice. We do have 19 seconds. I guess it's done. Or After this poll, we are going to touch upon an interesting topic, which is the bonus section for this session today. You got the polling results? Awesome. So what we have is 10% uh, on Bootstrap and PNP 13% awesome. I would not be surprised to see these results going to set automation going forward in a few days. Great. Thank you, team. Thanks for uh, writing all the poll answers. Yes, the bonus part, the zero tech provision in today's pandemic situation, like a lot of work from home is happening, a lot of micro, micro branch type of use cases are popping up where you need to provision the device without getting into vicinity of the location. You don't want to get into the home that the uh, admins do not have to travel to the place where this um, new work from home office has to be established and things like that. You can do it all remotely with the single image related uh, benefits that we saw, the plug and play related benefits that we saw in this session. All of this possible with zero touch, including your home Wi-Fi network or the office Wi-Fi network extended to your home network. In SD-WAN use case, in non-SD-WAN use case, iOS, exit traditional routing use case, all of that completely end-to-end -end automation, and that's what the bonus part I was talking about. First use case, securing everything, and that's what we were hinting on. The pandemic situation has taught us a lot in terms of what needs to be done in automation era at such. So without talking into the detailed use case again, let me go here where the single image 
it's based on the, the cloud portal based end to end automation, how it helps. First, PNP, as we know, helps us to boost, uh, get the complete orchestration from order till the controller profile attachment part of it. Then we have the V manage for SD WAN use case where you can sync the smart account, send it to controller, pre provision the device template. You have all the configuration already provisioned in V manage even before device is turned on. So, what happens next? You give this, like say, for example, an enterprise giving the router to, or just ships the router with an LTE SIM, for example, uh, going towards 5G is going to be very useful again, the same use case. Just get shipped, the uh, device gets shipped and, and uh, with an instruction set, okay, just insert the SIM in this particular slot and turn on the router. That's it. Employee doesn't have to do anything. The teleworker doesn't have to do anything else. Router turns on, the device contacts to the PNP agent, a, a PNP portal gets booted into autonomous mode, then controller mode, and successful PNP happens. Config gets from the vManage, which is pre-deployed anyway. And then the next thing, which is SID configuration, because all these small router SR1Ks have the Wi-Fi access point inbuilt. This is where the, the gist is where SSID also gets provisioned automatically using Office extension access protocol using our DHCP option 43 type of uh, configuration on the router, which gives the pointer towards the WLC sitting into the data center. That's what we are talking about. So this is the use case that we are discussing, remote work office. I'm sorry something has gone wrong with the slides format there, uh, the first two words, but what we are talking is Data center will have the WLC and all the managed other con uh, controller, cloud controllers anyway. Those will help provision everything that the user needs with the help of DHCP option 5043 and all at your home. The user just has to turn on the router, inserting the same. Nothing, no admin has to go to home. Nobody has to do any physical contacts as such. And everything gets provisioned end to end and user is able to access the internet efficiently. SD WAN use case, right? You can also have the Ethernet WAN interface connected here. Just ask the user to connect this router behind his existing home Wi Fi router. That's it. <clears throat> Let's look at the non SD WAN use case. Again, same philosophy. PNP works as equally good with the help of single image benefits in iOS XE use case as well. So, just that we have to add the correct controller profile, which will redirect to either your DNAC or network services orchestrator type of NSO type of controller profile, which will have the required configuration for this device. Same again, it can be a pop-up situation also, right? Small um, office uh, where hospital or things like that, which are popping up at the deal, uh, the temperature checking locations and things like that, which needs internet connectivity. Those can also have this, just put the LTSM and turn on the device. The here non sd one use case we are talking, the legacy way of using it via VPN technologies, still possible. In this case also, the WLC can help with option 43 to automate end-to-end -end, like your office Wi-Fi network gets extended to your home as is from the WLC sitting in the enterprise domain. And last but not the least, uh, the old beautiful bootstrap booting the device. Just have the configuration uh, in Cisco RTR.cfg type of config file and insert the USB into the device and ask the user to turn on the router. That's it, nothing else. Everything else happens with the help of LTE communication or the WAN connectivity that the user may have got at home and gets provisioned and connected to the data center of that enterprise with the help of small USB, that's it. So you don't really need to have a controller to do the PNP. You can do it with bootstrap in such situations as well and ready to access the internet. That's it, a quick call on the references. So these are various slides. Feel free to ask if there are any questions or like post them. Lot of good data here, documentation. The end-to-end -end teleworker or micro branch use case is documented in community blogs here. There are links here. You will see everything in detail. We also have a in the embedded event manager way of provisioning this where the SSID, in case you don't have WLC or that type of thing, the SSID can be provisioned using embedded event manager or it can be also provisioned using a standalone 
GUI that can be accessed uh, in the Cisco Air Provision APME mode. So all these benefits of end-to-end -end applications are automation, but in case where not end-to-end -end automation is possible, there are ways to do it with, say, one-touch automation and things like that. So feel free to use these resources. Okay, so, well, thank you very much, first of all, Matt, for sharing all this information, tons of information. And uh, for all who are very interested, they can find, remember, the recording is going to be available at the event page just where you register for this event in a couple of days. We take between one to two days uh, until we post it there. And also, you can have a look to the slides. You can see they have tons of information, very useful. And thank you so much, Corelli and Padip. You have done a wonderful job answering all of the questions. And well, uh, since we don't have anything extra, remember that if you have any further questions, we, we can answer them in the Ask Me Anything event, forum event that we have till next Friday, June 19. So uh, you have that one available. All the details are on the chat. And well, finally, uh, if you're looking for all the information that we have, uh, we have information on Twitter. You can find us on Facebook and in all the other social media channels that we have, like YouTube, LinkedIn, and the technical app that Cisco has for their customers and partners as well. Also, if you will speak another language rather than English, we do have trainings like this and sessions like this in different languages from Spanish, Portuguese, Chinese, Japanese, Russian, and French, which is our latest and newest local community. So you can find events like this in those local languages as well. And finally, if you're looking for further IT training, uh, you can find videos, uh, webinars, seminars, everything like that in the Cisco Learning Network. They actually provide tons of material, and also if you are looking in particular for things related to um, new Cisco certifications, you can find all the information just right there. And well, once again, thank you so much for your time. Uh, you're going to have a survey just uh, uh, once we complete this event. Please help us out to fill it out. Let us know how we are doing, what did you like about this event, what you did not like, and also, in particular, let us know what kind of topics would you like to see in further events so we can provide you that, that, that session. And well, for all of you who actually fill out this survey, you can redeem a 35% discount on any title, on any e-learning, on any e-book from the Cisco Press. Uh, that is the discount. If you have any issues of using that code, please contact me uh, and I will help you out with that. And well, once again, thanks for joining today. Um, and for being with us, we know these are like very uncertain times, but we kindly appreciate the fact that you joined us on this session. And once again, thank you, and thank you, Kureli, Suman, and Pradeep, and the rest of the team that is uh, helping us out to make this possible. So I wish you have a wonderful day, and see you next time. All right. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.